The Language Instinct by Steven Pinker, book review. So, this is one of my scripted book review series in which I take an old review I wrote years ago on the weblog and try and make a YouTube video out of it, reading what I wrote years ago, maybe adding in some other thoughts for whatever that may or may not be worth. Sorry, it's early in the morning, so my voice is still a little bit hoarse. Bear with me. This, this is a book I read and reviewed on the weblog 10 years ago. And I read it right before I was starting a master's degree in applied linguistics. And I was starting that degree based on my experience having taught English in Japan, but I knew I was very weak on the theory. So I, I was looking for some sort of books to give me a, a quick brush up in linguistics before I started the program. And I got this book actually off my sister's bookshelf. My sister actually had done her PhD in linguistic anthropology. And she had a number of books on her shelf about linguistics. Uh, and this one looked very interesting and it looked very readable. Uh, it's, it's a book aimed at a popular audience. It's something that you would find in popular bookstores. So I grabbed it off her shelf and I read it before I started my program. And <clears throat> I am so glad I read this book before I started that program because uh, it turned out to be very useful to have a lot of this background knowledge about the theory of linguistics. Even though what I was doing was more based towards uh, what they call applied linguistics, which is usually learning second languages or teaching second languages, which is not directly related to this book. <clears throat> but there is still that connection between applied linguistics and regular linguistics. And occasionally my professors would make references to something from regular linguistics, and then it was quite useful for me to have this book. Uh, I actually have a copy with me here now, and this is not the copy I read 10 years ago. Uh, this copy was at my school, which is teaching English as a second language. Uh, you can see it's a photocopied version, which is quite common here in Southeast Asia at language schools. Uh, this was used in the teacher training department of my school for people who were going to go on to do a Delta. Uh, an advanced qualification in teaching English as a second language. Uh, and again, I, I think the theory being that even though it's about general linguistics and not about second language acquisition, it's still useful to have a background in general linguistics. Uh, the teacher training department at my school shut down, which is why I was able to grab this copy here from my own library. So uh, I might be referencing this throughout the video. This, this isn't the copy I read 10 years ago, but uh, this is the copy I have now. So this book uh, was originally published in 1994. Uh, I believe there are some editions since then that have been updated, but I don't think it's been substantially reworked since 1994. Cer certainly the edition I read 10 years ago was the 1994 edition. <clears throat> it's by Steven Pinker, who's not technically a linguist. He's a cognitive psychiatrist, psychologist, cognitive psychologist. A a he's, he's, he studies the brain, um, but he's... Uh, he was working at RMIT with Noam Chomsky and he, he's uh, taken an active interest in how the brain uh, the, how the, the brain processes language. Uh, he has, <clears throat> since this book came out, he's published a few other books which have been a bit controversial. Uh, what were their names? You, you can look this up. I think it was Our Better Angels and he, he had something about the Renaissance. And he's kind of been accused of falling into that same orbit of people like, I don't know, Eric Weinstein or Brett, Brett Weinstein or Sam Harris. Um, people who are nominally on the left but publish a lot of things that get other people on the far left upset. So that maybe has biased people against him since then, but uh, I don't think that needs to affect this particular book. Uh, well, I don't know. You, you can be your own judge. I, I don't let it 
affect this particular book. Uh, I, I, I think this particular book is still worth, well worth reading, whatever you think of the stuff he's published since then. So the purpose of the language instinct is to make available to a popular audience the, the linguistic theory and research which has gone on in the past 60 years. <clears throat> so as Pinker says in the book, there's, there's really been an explosion in linguistics since the 1950s, uh, with, uh, both in terms of linguistic theory uh, and also in terms of what a lot of the research has told us about how people learn first and second languages. And that research has not become available to the public. It is mostly published in, sorry, mostly, yeah, mostly published in academic journals where it's written in a very obscure academic tone. Uh, and so the purpose of this book, Steven Pinker's book, is in part to make this available to a broader audience. Uh, and as such, I think it's a very useful book. Um, it's... Yes, it's, it's, it's a book that's written for a popular audience. I was able to read it easily enough. Uh, there were some parts that I had to read carefully. Uh, and I think these were particularly the parts where he's talking about how our brain decodes grammatical sentences. So, it, it, it was a fascinating part to read. He talks about how sentences are structured and how our brain can decode the meaning of some of them, but there are other sentences where, for whatever reason, our brain reaches capacity and we can't decode it. And I'll, I'll give you some of the examples he used in the book, because <clears throat> I, I think this is quite interesting stuff. He talks about a sentence like, the dog bit the cat. Simple enough, now we can put in some subordinate clauses in that sentence. Uh, the dog, the fire burned, Beat, bit the cat. And that still makes sense. <clears throat> and you can talk about the dog, the stick, beat, bit the cat. But if you put both of those in, the dog, the stick, the fire, burned, beat, bit the cat, then our brain can no longer process that sentence. Uh, and he talks about why that is. What, what is our brain doing when it decodes a sentence? Uh, and he also gives <clears throat> positive examples of uh, very complex clauses that actually our brain can make sense of. Like, remarkable is the rapidity of the motion of the wing of the hummingbird. And let me see if I can find it in this copy here. Uh, as you may suspect from some of those examples, when you actually read the book, there's a lot of sentence trees going on here. I don't know if you can see this with the camera focusing, but he, he's breaking apart these sentences, telling about which goes where and how our brain is processing them. Uh, he talks about the human parser. So this is some part of our language device or our subconscious or something that's going around along and looking at the elements in the sentence and organizing them into meaning. Uh, and, you know, he, I mean, here's another example here how various words will send the parser off in various directions trying to organize the sentence into meaning. Uh, and this this is all fascinating stuff. Um, this, this was my first exposure to this, but he makes a point in the book that when linguists talk about grammar, this is what they're interested in. Whereas most people think of grammar as a list of rules of stuff you can't do, right? Like you can't split an infinitive, you can't use a double negative. Uh, you, you know, like the, the high school English class grammar. But uh, Pink Pinker says that linguists actually aren't interested in that at all. Ling linguists aren't interested in what you can't do. Uh, or, you know, the, the rules about what you shouldn't do uh, from a prescriptivist standpoint, pr prescriptivist being the terminology they use. They're interested in how the brain can actually make sense of any meaning at all from the, uh, or how, how the brain processes the grammatical rules of a sentence. Uh, it's really interesting stuff. It's stuff that I never thought about before, which is interesting because 
you know, we speak language every day and we, we decode language every day. Um, but most of us, at, at, you know, at least me, never pause to think about what is going on in our brain when we hear an English sentence and our brain is able to decode that into meaning or when we're able to assemble our thoughts into a sentence which is grammatically encoded uh, and, and, you know, we never even think about the grammar uh, when, when we're saying this. I, I had some exposure to this before when I was teaching English in Japan, just, uh, you know, as a lay person, uh, and noticing that my brain was making a lot of complex computations somewhere in my subconscious to produce grammatical sentences that my Japanese students weren't able to do because English wasn't their first language, so they had to memorize all these things as rules. Uh, there are numerous examples. The thing that interested me most was omitting the relative pronoun. So, for, uh, what are the rules for this again? Sorry, this is going to be going down on a tangent a little bit, but uh, you could say, the man who I liked or the man who liked me. Uh, now, if it's the man who I liked, you actually don't need the who. You can just say the man I liked because the who there is functioning the man who I liked. It's functioning as the object of the relative pronoun clause. I like the man. So you can just say the man I liked. But if you say the man who liked me, then uh, who is functioning as the subject of the relative pronoun, man like me, so then you cannot omit it. You need, you need the who there. Sorry, I didn't explain that well enough, but may, maybe, maybe I gave a little bit of a sense uh, of all these complex grammatical rules that we as native speakers just say without even thinking about, but a non-native speaker actually has to memorize all these rules about how sentences are constructed. Um, so, yeah, it's a very interesting book. I did find, when I was reading that part about how the human parser makes sense of sentences, uh, and he's talking about noun phrases and verb phrases and subordinate clauses, I did need to read this in a quiet room. I was initially trying to read this in the living room of my parents' house, where the, you know, the TV was on and the, the, the cat was running around and people were talking. Uh, and I, I actually couldn't make sense of it then. I did need to go to a quiet room and sit down and read it. That said, if I was in a quiet room and I was sitting down and reading it, it was definitely, I definitely could make sense of it. And this was so much easier than the stuff I subsequently went on to read when I started the grad, the grad school program. Uh, so it, it does require some effort of concentration, but it, it, it is still a book aimed at a popular audience. Uh, and in line with that, a book being aimed at a popular audience, he uses a lot of pop culture references to make his points. So he quotes Mark Twain a lot, he talks about Woody Allen movies, he talks about Saturday Night Live skits, uh, he talks about the Nixon Watergate tapes at one point when he's emphasizing, or sorry, when he's illustrating uh, what people's grammar looks like when they're speaking versus what, what it looks like when, when, when it's written down. So apparently this was a little bit before my time, but when after the Nixon Watergate tapes broke, transcripts of this were published in the papers uh, and people were reading the transcripts about what Nixon and his aides were saying and people were very surprised that it was you know, if you've ever seen the Nixon Watergate transcripts or, or portions of them, it looks like just gibberish when it's printed down on the, on the printed page. Uh, it's not grammatical and it's not entirely clear uh, how one thought is progressing to the next. And Steven Pinker says, yeah, th this is what spoken language looks like, uh, especially when it's between two people who are talking about some sort of assumed shared knowledge. Uh, and he, he goes through and talks about that in the book, and that's a whole nother very interesting section of the book. Um, so, yeah, a, a lot of interesting stuff in here. Uh, now, uh, the book, among other things, 
talks about Chomsky's theories of universal grammar. That, that's not the only thing in this book. Uh, he, he, he does talk about a number of different things related to linguistics and, you know, he talks about phonology and uh, uh, how sounds are decoded and he talks about, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different things in here. But a, a big thing is Chomsky's theories of universal grammar. Now, I had long been a fan of Chomsky's political work uh, since I was in college. Uh, and Chomsky, I think, with the general public, to the extent that he is known at all, is more well known nowadays for his political theories uh, than he is for his linguistic stuff. I think a lot of people are like me. They discover Chomsky via his political stuff, and then they find out somewhere along the line that he also had a career in linguistics, but most people don't really know much about what his linguistic theories were. I, I had picked up somewhere along the line, I think on that Chomsky documentary, Manufacturing Consent, that Chomsky was famous for something called universal, universal grammar. And I thought I knew what that meant, but I really didn't, um, you know, because I hadn't really done any research on it. So, this is a very good primer on universal grammar, and it's useful because Chomsky's own linguistic writings are very difficult to read. And th this is a point Pinker makes in this book. Uh, he quotes a paragraph from one of Chomsky's linguistic papers. Where is it? I don't see it here. It, it's in the book somewhere. Uh, quote, quotes a uh, paragraph from Chomsky's l linguistic papers. Uh, it makes a point that th it, this is really hard to, to understand. Uh, it says, even trained linguists sometimes have a hard time making it through Tr Chomsky's writing. Uh, the exact same point has been made by other writers. Uh, I, I, Vivian Evans, in another book I reviewed, <clears throat> also said that it's very hard to read Chomsky's linguistic writing. Uh, it's ironic because Chomsky's political writing is so clear and, and so easy to read for anybody. But yeah, that, that's one of the reasons why most normal people don't know what Chomsky's grammar theories are, uh, because his, his academic writing is so opaque. And so that's another value of this book, is it, it makes it clear uh, what the basics of universal grammar are. I, I actually have another book here, Chomsky's Universal Grammar and Introduction, which I also picked up 10 years ago and never finished. Uh, this book, you can see this is where my bookmark is here. I made it 48 pages through this. Uh, and, and this book is readable more or less, but it was hard going and I got discouraged. This is still on my list of books to finish someday. But yeah, The Language Instinct. Uh, very clear, very readable, very easy to understand uh, about what this, what the whole fuss about Chomsky's theories were in the first place and why they revolutionized the theory of ling the, the field of linguistics about 60 years ago or so or, or more now I guess. Well, yeah, when did his big papers come out in the 1950s? So 70 years ago now. Um, now, Chomsky's theories of universal grammar are not accepted by everyone. So, uh, depending on who you talk to, some people are critical of it and some people are supportive of it. Uh, about a couple years ago, actually, I was talking to a, a new teacher at our school, somebody who actually had done cognitive linguistics back in college. And I said, oh, right. I said, you know, I don't know a lot about cognitive linguistics, but I did read The Language Instinct by Steven Pinker. And he said to me, excuse me, he said, no, that's all wrong. Uh, it's all wrong. Nobody believes it anymore. And I said, really? Because when I read that book, I, I certainly got the impression from Steven Pinker that uh, he was representing what had been a major strand in the field. Uh, and this guy, the next day, he brought to me a book to read, which is called The Language Myth, why language is not an instinct. 
which is a direct response to this book. So this book is called The Language Instinct. The other book is called The Language Myth, Why Language is Not an Instinct. That book is by Vivian Evans. Uh, and I've reviewed that book on this YouTube channel, channel as well. Uh, so if, if you want to see my thoughts on that, you can search this YouTube channel for The Language Myth. Um, so there, there's a whole book written in response to this one. And there are also various articles that you can find online written in response to this one. Um, although I don't believe any of the, I don't believe that book written in response to this has been nearly as pop, as popular. So this book, The Language Instinct, uh, is still in print. It's still available. I've actually seen it at bookstores in Cambodia and in Vietnam, uh, in, in the English sections of those bookstores, but in those bookstores nonetheless. Uh, so it's, it's still being printed and it's still being read. Um, the, the response to it, I don't believe is nearly as popular. You may have to do a little bit of searching to find that book, um, the language myth. Uh, but I, yeah, I guess just be aware that there are people in linguistics who don't agree with everything in this book. Uh, that being said, here's another book I picked up. This is called The Power of Babel by John McWhorter. I actually haven't read this one yet. This is on my to-be-read list. John McWhorter, I don't know if you recognize the name. He's, he's a famous linguist who's always on TV. So uh, if, you know, MSNBC or CNN needs a linguist to go on TV and talk about Donald Trump's speech patterns and what we can learn about that, uh, John McWhorter is almost always the linguist they go to. He's, he's very popular on TV. I haven't read this whole book, but I skimmed through it. And he's got a section on the back here where he talks about the Chomskyan paradigm. Uh, and he says, it, possibly the Chomskyan paradigm has fallen out of favor now and the field moves, has moved on. But he said, there's a reason why it was so captivating towards the field in the first place when this first came out in the 1960s. Uh, and he mentions the language instinct and he says, Steven Pinker's book, The Language Instinct, should, in my opinion, be required reading for all thinking people. Uh, and I think I go along with that. I mean, uh, Chomsky is to linguistics like Freud is to psycholo psychology, psychiatry. Like Freud is to psychiatry. Uh, meaning, even if you don't agree with Freud, you still need to know his theories because people in psychiatry are either writing in favor of them or they are writing against them. And even the people who are writing against them assume a basic knowledge of what Freud's theories are. I, I think Chomsky is the same to linguistics, meaning even if you disagree with Chomsky's theories, uh, it's still useful to know them in order to understand what the modern field of linguistics is nowadays. Uh, and, uh, yeah, John McWhorter says every thinking person should read the language instinct. And I think I go along with that. I mean, if you, if you have ambitions to be a modern day thinking person and know a little bit about all the important fields of human endeavor, and I, I think linguistics is, I mean, this was my first four way, four way into linguistics, but, um, once I got into it a little bit, you know, you stop and think about the fact that we speak and we use language and our brain produces sentences all the time. I mean, I'm speaking right now. It's interesting to stop and think about what actually goes on when we construct languages. So it, it is probably something that even if you're not studying linguistics as your major, it's useful to know a little bit about. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, a nice introduction to this, the language instinct, is useful for every thinking person to read, maybe in the 21st century. And if you have the time, read both books. Read The Language Instinct by Steven Pinker and read Why Language is Not an Instinct by Vivian Evans. Uh, but definitely th this is the, the book that's more easier to find of the two. Um, 
yeah, what, what else do I want to say about this book? Oh, there's... Sorry, I should have mentioned this before. Uh, I, I was mentioning how there's a lot of pop culture references in this book. Uh, there's also a, a part in this book which talks about 1984. Uh, and I found that very interesting uh, because 1984 was has been a book that had a big influence on me. Uh, it's, it's a book I read through several times. Uh, now granted, several of those times have been on audiobook where I've listened through it several times, but it, 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 it's nonetheless a book that I've encountered several times and absorbed a lot out, out of. And I, th I think it's a book that made a big impact on a lot of people. Uh, and uh, Steven Pinker quotes an extended section of 1984 here in his section on mentalese. Now, if you recall from 1984, well, I'll just maybe read the section of the book that he quotes from. So this is, this is from chapter three, mentalese. It's uh, uh, Steven Pinker's book, but he's quoting 1984 in this section here, where he says, <clears throat> the purpose of Newspeak was not only to provide a medium, medium of expression for the worldview and mental habits proper to the devotees of INSOC, uh, INSOC meaning English socialism within the context of 1984, but to make all other modes of thought impossible. It was intended that when new speak had been adapted once and for all, and old speak forgotten, a heretical thought that is a thought diverging from the principles of Insac, should be literally unthinkable, at least so far as thought is dependent on words. Its vocabulary was so constructed as to give exact and often very subtle expression to every meaning that a party member could wish to express, while excluding all other meanings and also the possibility of arriving at them by direct methods. This was done partly by the invention of new words, but chiefly by eliminating undesirable words, and by stripping such words as remained of unorthodox meanings, and so far as possible of our all secondary meanings whatsoever. A quotation actually goes on for a little bit, but, but maybe you get the point from that. Uh, or more likely, perhaps you remember this from 1984. Uh, as illustrated by that quotation, there was this big theme in 1984 about how the party wanted to simplify the language so much that people couldn't even think uh, about concepts like freedom or liberty uh, because the words would no longer exist in the language to express their, those concepts. The assumption being that uh, thought was dependent on words. And Steven Pinker explores that in his section on mentalese where, spoiler alert, I guess, he ultimately comes to the conclusion that thought is not dependent on words uh, and that there is a system where we think mentalese which then gets translated into words. So that whole program in 1984 about eliminating heretical thought by simplifying the language would not in Steven Pinker's uh, mind work. Uh, I've, since I've read this book 10 years ago, I've uh, gotten to a number of barroom conversations where people have been talking about uh, the idea of whether or not thought is dependent on language. Uh, and I found it very useful to reference Steven Pinker's work on this. Although to be honest, sometimes I find myself I, uh, not able to adequately reproduce what Steven Pinker said. So I, you know, I find, I find myself just saying, Read Steven Pinker's book. It's in there. He explains it much better than I do, uh, which is, is probably what I'm going to have to resort to during a lot of this review. But it's, it's an interesting section. Um, th there are a lot of interesting sections on this book. Uh, another interesting section is his chapter 11, uh, The Big Bang, in which he talks about how language and universal grammar could be explained by evolution. Now, this is one of the places where he diverts from Chomsky. Um, most of the book uh, is very sympathetic to Chomsky's theories on language, 
But Chomsky, as Steven Pinker says, Chomsky was always very re has always been very reluctant to place his theory of universal grammar inside of any sort of evolutionary theory. Uh, Chomsky believes that grammar is too complex to be needed.